Oh yeah, I wanted to talk about this. <sighs> Weekly videos, okay. I'm gonna try and pre-film a whole bunch of videos this week going into finals, but I am in college. Weekly videos are obviously not going to be my first priority. My academics are 100% my first priority and content creating comes at a very close second. But if I'm not focusing 100% on my academics, I do fall behind. My roommates just came home, I'm sorry if you can hear them. There was like that month I was posting like twice a week every week and my academics start suffering so i have to start focusing on them again i'm probably going to start just filming a whole bunch of videos in a day i have free and then editing those whenever it's time to upload them but i don't have time to research all these cases to film them edit them and also do all my academic work like it's just not possible and i'm really sorry about that but i enjoy making videos and i want to post whenever i can so bear with me while i figure out what i'm gonna do Why are we so overexposed today? <gasps> okay, I fixed it. I fixed it, okay. <laughs> Hey, what's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name's Amber. Just in case you didn't know it, thank you so much for joining me today. Today, I'm just gonna hope I have enough memory on my card. I'm gonna hope I have enough battery in my camera. This is the only time I can film this video. I literally say that every week. That's so funny. Okay, um, apparently nowhere in a 10 mile radius of where I live has SD cards right now. So I'm just gonna hope for the best, see what happens, and we're just gonna roll with it. So, but welcome back to another True Theory Tuesday. Today I'm going to be talking about something It's very famous. It literally changed the way that we take medication today and that is the Chicago Tylenol murders. So the Chicago Tylenol murders happened from September to early October of 1982 and they all started whenever Mary Kellerman of Elk Grove Village in the suburbs of Chicago was complaining to her parents about having like a sore throat, a runny nose, and so her parents gave her one extra strength Tylenol capsule to like help with her symptoms. Following taking this capsule, Mary died by 7 a.m. On that same day, a 27 year old man named Adam Janus in a neighboring suburb of the one Mary was in, Arlington Heights, Illinois, also died of what was thought to be a massive heart attack. After this happened, his brother Stanley, who's 25 years old, and his sister-in-law Teresa, who was 19 years old, rushed to his house in Arlington Heights to console and mourn with their loved ones. If you've ever had a member of your family pass away, then you know it usually comes with like a massive migraine just from like being so upset. And so they both each took one or two extra strength Tylenol capsules which were from the same bottle that Adam had taken previously that day, and Stanley died that very day and Teresa died two days later. Over the following days, three more strange deaths occurred and the victims' names were 35-year-old Mary McFarlane from Elmhurst, Illinois, 35-year-old Paula Prince from Chicago, and 27-year-old Mary Weiner from Winfield, Illinois. And all of the victims that had died over all of these days had taken extra strength Tylenol capsules shortly before their death. And it was at this point in early October 1982 for investigators to kind of begin making the connection between all of these deaths that were, you know, ruled poisoning deaths and the Tylenol. All of these people died after taking Tylenol because every capsule that was taken was laced with a lethal dose of cyanide. After the deaths, McNeil Consumer Products and Johnson & Johnson, which were the two manufacturers of Tylenol at the time, took a really active role in putting out warnings, telling people not to take Tylenol at the time, and also recalled over 31 million bottles of Tylenol. There were a few tainted bottles of Tylenol found that same month, which had fortunately not been, you know, consumed or even bought yet and they were all found within the Chicago area, only in the Chicago area, so this obviously led to them realizing that the tampering did not occur in manufacturing, but it occurred in the store, that like in the stores in Chicago and not, you know, at the factories. So this led to investigation because it was now, you know, like murders. You know, I mean, it would be murders either way, but like now it's like the Chicago police gotta do something about it. You know, it's like not the FDA. After investigations began on this event, it became a really confusing case to police and a lot of police hypothesized that someone could have gone into the stores, taken the bottles, laced them with cyanide, and just put them back on the shelf for people to buy and consume and ultimately pass away. I mean, I feel like that's kind of obviously what happened, but 
That's what police hypothesized. To this day, the perpetrators of the Tylenol murders have never been found, but there have been like a few suspects to arise, but none of them really came out to anything. They all, you know, went to closed ends. But there was one man who police looked into extra hard who I want to talk about, and that is James Williams Lewis. Lewis claimed to be the person who caused these deaths and also sent a ransom note to Johnson & Johnson demanding that they give him one million dollars in order to stop the deaths that have been occurring with the Tylenol in Chicago. And here's the thing about Lewis, okay? Here's the thing about James. <sighs> he had a weird past. Um, in 1978, Lewis had been charged with a Kansas City murder after police found the remains of one of his former clients in bags in his attic. And get this, okay? His charges were dropped because the judge said that the police illegally searched his house so he couldn't be charged for the human remains they found in his attic. So at this point, police were like, we should probably look into him. But after investigating, police couldn't tie Lewis to the Chicago murders because he and his wife lived in New York and he had no credible ties to the events that had happened in Chicago. So he was just kind of cut out as a suspect, but I just thought that was really weird. I thought that was a really... <laughs> Although he wasn't arrested on being the person who caused the Chicago Tylenol murders, he was arrested on extortion and like a whole bunch of other criminal charges and was sentenced to 20 years in prison, but he got out in 1995 after serving 13. That's just, that's so weird to me. This is gonna be one of the shortest videos I've ever done. Hold on, let me take another cold of my gallon. It's like about to break my side table, that gallon. I have like this little thin metal side table in my dorm and it's like, it's like that under the gallon right now. Following the Chicago Tylenol murders, other similar cases involving Tylenol and other store-bought medications also occurred in the late 1980s going into the early 1990s, but none of them were as deadly as the Chicago Tylenol murders in themselves. So before the 1982 events, Tylenol took over 35% of store-bought and over-the-counter pain reliever medications. And after the Chicago Tylenol murders, that number dropped down to 8%. So Johnson & Johnson was like, we need to fix that. That's not good. Working with the FDA, Johnson & Johnson introduced the new packaging that we see on all store-bought medications and medications in general which is like the little safety proof thing, you know, like the little foil you have to pull off so like you can see if it's been opened or not. You know, I found out about this case like a couple years ago, so now every time I buy like Midol or something, I like open it first to see, you know. I just don't, I don't want to go out like that. <laughs> In 1983, the US Congress passed what was called the Tylenol Bill, which made it a federal offense to tamper with medications or anything in stores. And in 1989, the FDA established federal guidelines. So all items of this such had to have this tamper-proof packaging, which is why we see it on all store-bought and medication products that we have today, you know? Like we even have the, the little pop-out thing, you know, like birth control. So yeah, I wanted to talk about this case because I think it's really interesting. I think this one, the weirdest cases that have happened, and that's not true. There's a lot of weird cases going on. They're like James Lewis not being charged for having human remains in his attic. That's pretty weird. It's pretty strange, but that's how the justice system works, so it's fine. Um, yeah, no, the Chicago Tylenol murders are the reason why we have packaging like we do today on medications. It's the reason why a lot of our products have like tamper-proof packaging now, you know, and then earlier, I think it was this year, maybe it was late last year, we had like that whole problem where like TikTokers were going around like opening ice cream and like throwing it at the camera. That's illegal. That's like a federal offense. That's bad. And that's why that was such a big deal. I think this case is really interesting. So I really hope you do too. I really hope you enjoyed this video because that is it for today's video. Um, if you enjoyed, make sure you go down below, like, subscribe, catch me on all my other medias, my Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. <laughs> make sure talking tiktokers and <laughs> promoting my tiktok haha <laughs> will all be linked down below so you can see what i'm doing whenever i'm not posting here um that's it for today's video if you enjoyed make sure you go down below like subscribe i already said all that and i guess that's it bye <laughs>
know about this case a couple years ago, so now every time I buy like my doll or something, he's getting an order right now. Not right now. Okay. Um, look at that. Oh, that's not that bad. That's not that bad of a difference. That's good.